I don't care how late you stay out. Stay out as late as you want. You wanna borrow the new car? You wanna borrow my credit card? Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy, super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ooh, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. Pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. Well, what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow and you've known about it for four weeks and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey! Hey, can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Mmm, vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18's a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, could you leave the front door open for a couple hours? Thanks. Whoa, money really does grow on trees. Happy Father's Day again, you know, Father's Day. Uh, any holiday is really, uh, um, you know, has mixed emotions involved in it. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's some, uh, this is fresh, your, your father's passed away or something like that. Uh, you know, some of you didn't have a great childhood. You didn't have a father, whatever it may be. And some of you are celebrating, praise God, man, I finally got a relationship with my father. And, and others are new fathers, you know what I mean? Your babies haven't had time to, to, like, be disappointed in you yet. And it's awesome, you know what I mean? And so it's like... <laughs> You know, they still think you know everything. It's awesome. And uh, you know what I mean? And uh, so, you know, I mean, it, there's like, you know, for, for the, even the fathers that have kids, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes I just hate holidays. <laughs> I mean, that, there's sometimes I just do. It's just like, because I know people are going to be hurting. I know some people are celebrating and different things like this. It's just a mixed bag of emotions. And then other times I just really love them because I'm learning to enjoy them. And, uh, you know, and just have fun with them and different things like that. And, you know, and so we're, you know, on Father's Day, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some things about fathers and about men and stuff like this, and basically about how God created things and designed some things. And, uh, and so we'll be going over that and things, you know, and I love how we as human beings, you know, we, we're, how many you know we're geniuses? We, we stink in our, I mean, the human race and stuff like this, look at all the things. Electricity. I don't. I, you know, there's some of you who really get that. You know how it's all done and stuff like that. I'm one of the guys that appreciate when I push the button, it turns on. You know, uh, but I know there's quite a process to the whole thing. You know what I mean? That's like you know they, all kinds of different ways to make it. You know what I mean? Clean power, which I don't think is clean because what do you do with the waste? <laughs> You know, nuclear power. You know, you think about it, it's like, who wants to waste in your backyard? Nobody. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, they make it, you know, they learn how to like split an atom and make you know, steam, turbines, electricity. Like, it's amazing. And then they got these big stations that they take the high power and bring it down to something useful. And I could be wrong on all this whole. But anyway, you know, I mean, I see all these big things. And then there's like, you know, things on poles that blow up and make these great videos. It's awesome. And, and, it, and it comes into your house and doesn't kill you. <laughs> Click on awesome. Cook food, heat, air. Oh, oh, man. What if I told you that that evolved over billions of years? You go, you are an idiot. <laughs> okay, one, 
we got history and we know, amen, what happened, how, you know, whatever. But, you know, you look at electricity and electricity has been engineered. You, you understand that electricity has been here since the foundation of the world, right? But somebody learned how to use it and all these engineers really, I mean, love engineers. We should have a happy engineer day. You know what I mean? And appreciate everybody that's an engineer. Let's make it a holiday and then Hallmark can have new cards. It's awesome. Happy holiday engineer day, whatever it is, you know. Why? Because, man, everything that we, everything that we enjoy was made by and designed by engineers. Somebody invented it. Somebody engineered it. Yeah, all the engineers are going, yay, I love this. I knew I loved that man. All right, you know, it's like, <laughs> don't play trivial games with engineers either. It's, it's dangerous. They have information in there that really no one should carry. And uh, it, <laughs> it is that way. Barb would agree with me, you know, being married to one or whatever. But anyway, so, you know, and it's like, you know, my, I got engineers in my family and all this other kind of stuff. And it, it's just really wonderful. But, you know, you just, you think about it. Uh, things you can look at them and you go and you can marvel at them and you know and it's wonderfully engineered and can I just say this that even when God designed man obviously you look at man and, and it's it's amazing how engineered the human being is I mean you look at how complex we are I mean just even the the just the complexity of the electricity that our and our, our body runs by it's engineered way more complex than any of our electrical grid and all this other kind of stuff. It, it's amazing what happens. And just how everything works together and how the body was made. And I, you know what I mean? But it's amazing. If I put billions of years with that, I can convince you that we evolved. And yet, the engineering necessity for everything to work together is unbelievable. It's an engineering marvel. The human body. I mean, it, just even the eye. You look at a dissection of the eye. Have you ever done that? Go to the eye doctor and you look at it and like, oh, that's, you know, that's neat. That's how that works. No, think about it. That's how that works. All the little muscles that make things focus and the lens and things like this. And then you actually see everything upside down. Really, you're all on the ceiling. And, <laughs> and your brain flips it back around. <laughs> okay, that is slightly an engineering marvel. You know what I mean? How about balance? You know I mean, if you don't have it, you, you're really glad that it works when it does. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, you think about how God engineered just even the human body, and it's just amazing. The complexity, the engineering. And you know what? You know, and, and for all my friends who believe in evolution, and i got good friends that really believe in it and things like this, and I'm not mocking you, but really? Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't think, I think sometimes you look so close at something that you don't see the big picture sometimes. And for me, just, you know, and, and like I said, there's people way smarter than me that don't believe in evolution and, you know, things like this. And, of course, there's macro and micro evolutions and different things like this. And, and I think that God designed some things to be able to work that way and just whatever. But the engineering base of it all is just absolutely amazing. And engineering comes from an engineer. And just the way the universe is put together, this earth and all this other kind of stuff, guess what? Based on what? Engineering and things like this. Well, the neat thing about it is, is God designed you and I as human beings, and he also created ways for society to work. He, he created a whole system of things to work in a certain way. But our society has become confused by trying to engineer something outside of God's design. And you know what? And if you throw enough things together and you keep trying to mix it up and stuff like this, you know what I mean? It'll, it, it, it'll, it, you know, it'll look like it's working for a while. But at the end of the day, it won't. You know, I, I'm marriage licensed. And this is just me. I'm old school. For all you millennials watching, I'm just an old guy. Just, you know, this is the way I think. This is my society and stuff like this. But on a marriage license now, it doesn't say bride and groom. It just says spouse and spouse. Okay, society's changing. You know, I, it, it's interesting. You know, uh, my, my daughter took my grandkids to the dentist office the other day, and, and we were talking about it. And, and now, 
on the form it says, are you a male, a female, a male identifying as a female, a female identifying as a male. What does that got to do with your teeth? <laughs> well, if you're a male identifying as a female, we got to put a girl feeling in you. I don't think it works that way. I just don't think, I mean, like... See, it has nothing to do with the teeth. It has everything to do with trying to re-engineer society. Okay, there may be some places we're on a form that might be legit. You know what I mean? If you're a psychiatrist or something and somebody wanted some help in a certain area, you know what I mean, and they were dealing with something like that or didn't want to or just whatever, a psychiatrist is just there to help you to do whatever you think, you know, whatever. And you know what I mean? That might be a legitimate question at that point. You know what I'm saying? Or if you're going to a doctor and you had a sex change, I mean, you know, that might be something that they had to know or something along those. You know, there might be some places for that. But, and I could be ignorant of this, but I'm not sure that teeth are different in males and females. And if they're not, you know, I don't get the reason why. Maybe there's a really good reason. I'm just an old school guy, got a white beard. <laughs> all right, so I'm just saying, I might, I might not have it all put together, but I'm just saying, and I'm just making a point. My point could be wrong, but society keeps trying to some, do some things, you know, and mixing things up. I've got some water here. I don't know if you can all see it, camera over here. Awesome. You know, it's just regular water. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dye it red just for the sake of this, and I'm not going to get it on my clothes or anything in Jesus' name. All right, yep, perfection. And here I have some oil. How many know water and oil don't mix, right? And so we put it together. Hey, look, it's kind of pretty. And so I'm just going to make sure that it mixes up. <laughs> yeah, you all know me, don't you? <laughs> and uh, for all those of you watching on Facebook, I can make a mess out of almost anything. All right, so if I mix this up really nice... Woo! I almost went to high, but I knew better. I'm not going to do it. It'd probably foam all over the place and stuff like this. How, how many know it's mixed up like this, and it looks good, and it looks normal, it looks right? Hey, that's the way it should be, right? Well, let's, let's just keep preaching and set that right there. See what happens. Oh, something's already starting to happen. Too fast. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day... You know, you can keep trying to mix things up outside of God's design, try to re-engineer the way that God wanted to be. And if you keep throwing it out there, like at the dentist office or whatever, and you just keep trying to get society to accept the fact that the way God designed the family to be and all this other kind of stuff, you can keep mixing it up. You know what? It'll work for a while, and it'll look like it's mixed up. It looks like it's working and things like this. But at the end of the day, guess what? It's all going to come back to the way that God designed it to be. It just will. And I'm just going to show you this, and these are some things that I just want to share with you. The, the, the way God in the beginning made them male and female. He said a husband and a wife, and a husband and wife is a male and a female coming together. A family is is when they have a family, and, and there's a structure there, okay? And, um, and, you know, I mean, I'll get some hate mail about this and all this other kind of stuff, but I don't hate any homosexual. God doesn't hate any homosexual. Sometimes people ask me, can a homosexual get saved? And I go, you did. <laughs> you know? Well, no, homosexual. No, but you're an idiot, and you had sin in your life. And, uh, and I'm just saying, you know, and so he came to save those who were what? Lost. And so the only qualification to get saved is, is you have to understand that you're lost. You have to understand that you need help and that you have sin, right? And so it's like, don't ask dumb questions. You know, it's like, well, you know what? I decided I was going to be nice. I forgot. Ugh! I'm sorry. You're getting me raw today. It's just the way it is. All right. You know, I, really? I'm, he came to save the lost. So what's the qualification for getting saved? Ah! Sooner. Recognizing that you might have to need a Savior is the first step of getting saved, right? And so whatever that sin is, whether you lied one time in your whole life, you need a Savior. Whether you're a mass murderer and have killed millions of people, you need a Savior. And everybody in between. <laughs> Need a Savior, right? So the qualification to get saved is to recognize, I haven't done everything right, and I need a Savior, and I want Him, and things like this. And guess what? You get saved. So I'm not 
coming against homosexuality. I'm just telling you, God designed something, and we keep trying to mix it up, but at the end of the day, it's going to come back to what God said worked, and we're going to realize that. And the sooner we realize it, the better. Not hating anybody at all. Okay? So, get this. This is some research I did uh, several years ago. Looked at some new research. It's very accurate to this today. And this is not from a Christian study. This is from a secular university study, okay? And so this is, everybody say, these are non-Christians doing this study. Okay, just for, you know, okay, so everybody watching on Facebook land, this wasn't Christians having a bias and saying this, okay? This is what they studied, the effects of a father in a home. That's it. What are the effects of a father in a home? What are the effects of a fatherless home? All right? So if there's a father in the home, okay, and I, I wrote this in a way, there are five times less likely to commit suicide. Uh, that, that, okay, it didn't even say a good father. It just said the results of a father being in a home. Now, okay, obviously there's some really, 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 really bad fathers, and, and we're not condoning that, but they didn't check, you know, good or bad. You know, just the effect in our society, overall study, just having a father in the home, the kids have a five time, they're five times less likely to commit suicide. You know, suicide's ugly. And the thing that brings suicide into somebody's life, uh, I, I've been there, I understand what it's like. You know what I mean? I understand what it's like to be free, too, in Jesus Christ. And you can be free if you're dealing with that. But it's horrid. I mean, I can't even explain to you the place that brings you to that place, okay? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's beyond description. It is, I, I think, demonic uh, that drives somebody to that place. You know what I mean? Or extreme, extreme wounds. You know what I mean? Hopelessness. And, um, and so <clears throat> one of the things that we can do in society is um, let's, let's build the family again. Uh, 32 times less likely to run away. So uh, if a kid has a fatherless home, they're 32 times more likely to run away than if, than if they have a father in the home. 20 times less likely to have behavioral disorders. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because men and women are different. They play different roles in the home. Come on. And it's interesting. There's something healthy about it, having a father in a home. 14 times less likely to commit rape. Wow, that's a horrid sin, isn't it? Nine times less likely to drop out of high school. Ten times less likely to abuse uh, uh, drugs. Nine times less likely to end up in jail. The, the, one of the studies we looked at, okay, this is just having a father in the home. That's it. Why? Because God designed it that way. We keep trying to mix it up, but God designed a home to have a mother and a father. And it said this, this, this other study, the, this stat changed just a little bit, but it's very close. 85% of the youth in prison are from fatherless homes. 85% percent are from fatherless homes. Why, you want to fix the crime rate in America? The power of a father accepting responsibility and being a father makes a big difference. You know what that means, men? You're extremely powerful. Amen. That's awesome. But what is our society trying to do to men? Make them be boys for the rest of their life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, it's about fun. Let me just go have fun. I got more toys. I'm doing all sorts of stuff. And uh, hey, 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 I'm all in, baby. <laughs> but not at the expense of my kids. Not at the expense of my grandkids. Not at the expense of me having the, the responsibilities that I have. Come on. Not at that expense. You know, I'm at the age now where I'm starting to be a spiritual father to young people and getting them ready for their responsibilities in the church and stuff like this. Man, you know what? I can't shirk that. I can't just go, hey, I'm about ready to check out of here, man. Listen, I'm, just, I'm leaving. That'd be irresponsible. Right? It's important that I be the best example I can by changing my language and not being so mean. But, hey... 
Thank you. You know, um, it, 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 it's just amazing why. It, because we have to have health in our families. We need to have health in the church. You see, I think there should be multi-generational leadership in the church so that the young people come in and see generations of health going down. I didn't say perfection of health. You being a dad, the responsibility you have isn't perfection, but it is you being a man and letting your wife be a woman. But our society keeps trying to blend the sexes. I'm going to give you a story here, and I know many of you are young Christians and maybe haven't read this, and if you haven't read through your whole Old Testament, you never heard this story. So I'm actually going to read it because there's a lot of people that are in that situation in this church, and many of you on Facebook and in, uh, watching on YouTube and things like this are in that situation. It's nothing bad. It's just you haven't read through it all yet. And so I'm going to read this story because I think it depicts... Uh, some really cool things about men and women and some really cool things about what it is to be a man. Let me share this with you, and I'll get to it at, uh, at the end of this. But if you can't identify and you can't give me a description of what manhood is, there's a good chance you haven't entered it yet. What is it to be a man? I ask this to people all the time when I'm out, you know, and, and talking to them if it comes up and stuff like this. But if you can't give me a definition of manhood that is biblical, you're probably not one yet. This just means you're a male. Now, being a male in a home helps, obviously, statistically. How much more if a godly man in a home will even make a bigger difference? Amen? This is a story about David and a woman named Abigail. David is anointed king, but Saul is still king. But the anointing is on David. Saul is demon-possessed, trying to kill David. The spirit left him, you know, all this other kind of stuff. David is now on the run. David and uh, now 600 men are with him, traveling around, just staying away from Saul. He will not kill Saul, even though God delivered him into his hands several times. He's saying, I will not touch God's anointed. That's honor. He honored the position. Amen? And so, you know, people say, well, you know, there's all this up about police officers right now. Hey, stop. Honor the position. Not every police officer is perfect, but most of them are doing it because they, they're good people. So our society is trying to hate. Stop it. That was just free right there. All right. First Samuel 25, verse 2, and I'm going to read through verse 35. It's going to be a little bit, so you just hold on, listen. And no, I'm not going to have it come up because I want you to listen. Close your eyes. Soft music playing. <laughs> now there was a man in Moan uh, whose business was in Carmel. And the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. Come on, somebody. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal. And the name of his wife was Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. Got to put that in there. But, I, I, anyway, to me, when I read the Bible, these things pop up, so I'm just kind of like doing it with you. But the man, was, uh, the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was, the, um, he was of the house of Caleb. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men, and David said to the young man, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace to you, and peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. I now, now I have heard that you have shears. Your shepherds uh, were with, I hear that you have shearers. So it's time for you know, that to all happen. And he says, uh, your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them, nor was anything missing from them uh, all the while we were in Carmel. Ask your men, young man, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young man find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. Now listen, he's not demanding anything. He's saying, hey, whatever comes to your hand, whatever you choose to give me will be fine. I think this is reasonable. Until I lose my spot. Whatever comes to your hands, 
uh, your son David. So when David, the young man, came, uh, <clears throat> they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in the name of David and waited. Then Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is, the son, uh, who is this son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away uh, each one from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to, uh, uh, give it to men who, uh, when I do not know where they are from? So David's young man uh, turned on their heels and went back, and they came and told him all these words. Then David said to his men, Every man gird your sword, every man gird on his sword, and David also girded his sword. And about 400 men went with David, and 200 stayed with the supplies. Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us, and we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as they, uh, we accompanied them. When we were in the fields, they were, when we were coming in there in the fields, they were a wall to us both by night and by day, all the time we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what uh, you will do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a scoundrel uh, that uh, one can't, he's a, he's a bad dude. Then Abigail uh, made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, sheep uh, already dressed, five seahs of roasted grain, uh, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cake figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, go on before me. See, I am uh, coming after you. But, um, But she did not tell her husband Nabal. So it was as she rode on the donkey that she went down under the cover of the hill, and there were David and his men coming down at, toward her, and she met them. Now David said to her, Surely in vain uh, I have protected all this, fe- all this fellow has in the wilderness, so, not, so that nothing was missing uh, of all that belongs to him. And he was repaid me evil for good. May God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male of all that belongs to him by morning light. How many know he's mad? This guy just ticked off a warrior. And he went into warrior mode. Hey man, I protected you. I did all this kind of stuff. And what was he? He went into action right away. Now, the action is going to cost Nabal his life. Abigail's coming. Now, Abigail saw David. She dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. So she uh, fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. How many know you got a warrior and 400 of his men, and this guy has killed 10,000? They have songs about him. Come on, somebody. He killed Goliath, a lion and a bear. You got this man going, I'm killing everybody. Fall on your face, okay? And she's like, hmm. Says, please, Lord, uh, Please, let not my Lord uh, regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so he is. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young man of the Lord whom you sent. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm, seek harm, uh, for my Lord, be as Nabal. And now, and now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in, your, in you throughout your days. Yet a man has risen to pursue and seek your life. But the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies shall shall sling out as from a pocket of a sling. 
And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief to you, nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. Man, she's just pouring out wisdom to him, isn't he? She's reminding him of his calling. She's reminding him of his anointing. She's reminding him of his destiny. This is a wise woman. But when the Lord has dealt with my Lord, and then remember your maidservant. Please remember your maidservant. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice, and blessed are you, because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light no males would have been left to Nabal. So David received from her hand what she had and brought him and said to her, Uh, Go in peace to your house. See, I've heeded your voice and respected your person. I love this because within this story, you see so many things that depict manhood. Now, here at church, we do something in our men's ministry called men's fraternity. And in the first session of that, it describes what manhood is and describes manhood. Tenet number one is a man rejects passivity. Passivity is not a mark of a man. And if you're passive, that's something the Lord wants you to work on. It's something that he wants to help you with. He does not want you to be passive. How passive was David? <laughs> he heard the word, get your swords, we're going to town. Amen. I mean, they, they had it and they're ready and they're ready to act. Come on, somebody. He wasn't passive in his action and he wasn't passive in his repentance. He accepts responsibility, rejects passivity, accepts responsibility. David accepted the advice. Now, okay, I don't mean this to be degrading or anything like this, but women in that in that society didn't hold a place that men do. Okay, and and I don't even think that was by God's design. I think that was. (laughs) Okay, and some of that separating the way it should. So, you know, but they weren't acknowledged in in society. And so for David, a man who's anointed king, mighty warrior, killed thousands, killed Goliath, killed a lion, a bear like this, man, he's like, I'm killing everybody. You dishonored me? (laughs) I'll teach you. He comes and here's Abigail and she starts reminding him of what his destiny is and what God called him to do. Starts speaking to his future and doing all this other kind of stuff. And he heeded the voice of a woman, like I said, recognizing that was God and that was wise and in front of all of his men said, we're following that advice. I can guarantee you, if he wasn't the man that he was and the leader he was, they would have been going, you're listening to a woman? Okay, what did the disciples say when Jesus was talking to a woman? Okay, it wasn't accepted, okay? David was man enough. And he had action enough. He had wisdom enough that, one, his lack of passivity caused him to act, and his lack of passivity or his tendency towards action caused him to react properly in repentance. Does this make sense? Leads courageously. So rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously. How many know David's men were ready to follow him anywhere he was ready to go? I mean, all David needed to do was say, get your swords. Everybody's going, hey, where are we going? (laughs) Come on, you know what I mean? Fight, sure, in. David led these guys all over the place. These guys, when when Saul was delivered, read your your Bible, you'll see these stories. Twice Saul was delivered into the hands of David supernaturally. And his men said, listen, God delivered him into your hands. Kill him now. David was courageous enough to go, no, 
I will not touch God's anointed. I don't care what you are saying. These are mighty men. These are David's mighty men. Read the stories about these guys. These guys killed giants. These guys killed lions. <laughs> these guys, you know, one guy like took on a whole army to protect a thing of beans. Okay, uh, David one time says, I just wish I could get a drink of water from, from, from the well in, in, in Jerusalem. <laughs> Two guys go, water? You got it, boss. Man, they took off. They killed a whole bunch of people, went into the city where their enemy is, where all these people get a glass of water and come and give it to David. <laughs> these are not wimps. These are guys like if you see them coming, you go, Do I have any more clothes? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, just, you, you got the picture. Okay. When David said we we're going to do something, man, he led courageously, man. He, 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 they, they knew that David was not going to back down. They knew that it didn't matter if, it, if, if he was going to die or not. He was going to do what was right. He was going to lead. He was going to lead courageously. It didn't matter what it cost him. You know what I mean? And what did it cost him to lead courageously? He had to run around like a madman. He had like a nomad. He had no home because he chose to lead courageously and do the right thing rather than kill Saul and take the kingdom. That was not rightfully his. The anointing was his, and it was prophesied that it was his. He was anointed by the prophet Samuel for that to be his. Everything said, it's yours. Just get rid of the ungodly king. But he was courageous enough to do it God's way. That's a man. And he lives for and expects the greater reward. David didn't look to man for his reward. He looked to God. He says, if God wants me to be king, he'll get me there without me touching the anointed position. So what's the definition of manhood? Rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, and lives for the eternal reward. Amen. If you haven't gone through Men's Fraternity, we invite you to join up when that starts up again this fall. Sometime I'm looking for my men that would be able to tell me that. I just work here. I don't know dates. All right. <laughs> But, you know, you, you, you think about this. Um, even if you're in a situation where you're divorced or remarried or, you know, um, you never did get married, but you fathered a child or something like this, be this man. This is your calling. This is what manhood is. But it's a choice. It's not something that's going to happen biologically. You're male biologically. Choosing to be a man is something that is learned and accepted. And it needs to happen. Why? Because God made it that way. And no matter what we do and no matter how much we try to blend the sexes, no matter how much we in society say a man's not needed in the home, no matter how much we try to blend up in, in our sitcoms and our, all this other kind of stuff and make men to be stupid idiots, no matter how much we try to make him passive, at the end of the day, it's going to separate and it's just going to be that way and it's the way that works. Why? Because there was an engineer who made it. And it's the way it works. Amen? Now, women, uh, you know, I could go through you know, just Abigail in this story and women, be this woman. She wasn't afraid. She was courageous. Huh. She also knew that she was the weaker vessel in this case, as were most men, giants, and wild animals to David. <laughs> Think about it. Would you ever want to meet David on a bad day? And be his enemy? <laughs> and what did she do? 
she didn't get prideful and say, I'm just as valuable as you, and blah, 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 and I just, and I'm done, and you know, and his ass, and I'm going to take over, you know, hey, you know. <laughs> Women, you want your men to be men, but sometimes you're going to so not understand them, and that's okay. Let him be the warrior, the guy who's going to initiate. Let him be the guy. Let him, you know what I mean? We're in the gym screaming. It's awesome. You know, whatever. You know, let him, let him, let him be a man and let him, you know, whatever. And you're going you're gonna to have some wisdom and you're going to look at it and go, this idiot's about ready to kill everybody. <laughs> okay, it's part of our nature. Mess with our family, we're going we're gonna to kill you. It's just the way, you know... It, People will take that way out of context. We're going to defend. You know, somebody, I'm going to get letters on that one too. Doggone it. Send them to Lawrence Sherman at. Uh, <laughs> she'll read them for me. It'll be, it'll be wonderful. Yeah, she'll respond much nicer than I would too. But that's in the nature of a man. Don't mess with my family. There's a giant killer that's about to come out. It's just going to happen. Now, true manhood doesn't mean that you have to, like, you know, and that's a whole other thing. But there is a warrior in every man, but he's going to fight the way that he will fight. He will stand for what he's going to stand for, and it doesn't matter if he thinks he's going to win or lose. He has the responsibility to stand up, come on, and be a man, and and he's going to have that in him. And if he has a good woman behind him, he's going to have the courage to do what he's supposed to do. But if the woman tears him down, you're going to make him weak. You have a good, strong man in your home. It's going to make a difference not for your kids, but your grandkids, your neighborhood, and every, every, everywhere. Okay? And women, read about Abigail. My gosh. She's coming with wisdom and humility. And who was the wiser one in this case? She was. And men, when you're about ready to go to war for your family, your wife is probably going to come out with some wisdom. But wives, make sure you have wisdom and not fear-motivated speech. Wisdom. Okay? Does that make sense? She didn't come with fear-motivated speech. She actually came with wisdom and said, listen, this is your calling, this is your destiny, this is who you are. Don't mar that by this action. There may be a day that I, being a man, might have to stand up and go to prison for my belief in Jesus Christ. I'd be ashamed of my wife if she said, don't do that, don't go to prison, don't stand up for what your God says. I'd rather have her say, I married a man. Go be the man. If you end up in prison or you die, we will see each other again. But play the man. That's a woman. But too many times people out of fear, what will I do without him? What will I do? You know, whatever. No, don't go there. You have God. Be the man. Women, encourage your men to play the man. And Drizel is the word. And it's the word that when they would go to war, they would say, and reason what it meant was play the man do not act in fear and for those of you we'll learn that word in camp freedom and it's a strong word and i recommend everybody go through it so we here at resonate we want strong men and we want strong women we want the masculine and the feminine we want it to be God's way because this is the way that works and, and there's effort and things that have to happen in each one of the roles to keep it separated because you know what, in both cases, sometimes men, we just go, it's just easier if I just, just lay down and just let her have her way because I don't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> no, there's a time where you got to go, no, this is the way it's going to be. We're going to church. We're going to tithe. We're going to read to our kids. We're going to be a godly family, and that's it. Amen. We're going to do what's right. And sometimes when a man's going, we're going to do what's right in this home, it's because behind the scenes the wife is going, 
you can't beat the kids, okay? <laughs> They're okay. You're going to make, you know what I mean? Like the Nabal story. And, you know, I'm just making stories. Please don't take me too literally. But, you know, there's times there's talk behind the, the, the scenes where the husband and wife are talking. Then the husband comes out and the father of their home says, no, this is what we're doing. Okay? And this is the reason why we're doing it. What will happen? Let me just read this to you again. If there's a man in the home, and let's say a godly man, because this will even be greater, five times less likely to commit suicide, 30 times, 32 times less likely to run away, 20 times less likely to have behavioral disorders, 14 times less likely to commit rape, nine times less likely to drop out of high school, 10 times less likely to abuse drugs, nine times less likely to be arrested. So men, I release you to be men. Women, I release you to be women. Amen. And that's all I got, and I don't know how to end it, so let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. We thank you that you have uh, created us the way that you made us and the way that you want us. Help us and help our society to see that, Lord, and not that we'll ever hate or, uh, you know, uh, disrespect anybody who disagrees with us, Father, but... Um, we just know that the way you engineered things to be is the way things will work. And we just thank you for that, Father, in the name of Jesus. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here and you say, Pastor, I don't know that I'm right with God. You talked about this salvation. And the only qualification is, is you have to recognize you have sin. And if you're here, you're going, I have sin, and I recognize I need a Savior. You on Facebook, same thing. If you do this, you pray this prayer. You, you respond in this way. If you're here and you say, Pastor, that's me. I want to accept Jesus Christ. I want to accept his forgiveness. I want to accept him as my Lord. I want him to start to teach me and train me what it is to be a man or a woman, to play my role or whatever it is. If that's you, would you just raise your hand up real high right now and just say, Pastor, pray with me. I want to make Jesus Christ Lord. I want forgiveness of my sin. All right? All right, we're going to pray this. Everybody pray this out loud for the sake of those in this room and those on Facebook. Say this with me. Dear God, I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died on the cross. To pay, for my sin. to pay for my sin, and I've sinned. And, I've sinned. and you said in your word, you in your word if, I if I would call Jesus Lord, I would be saved. So I now do that. Jesus, I accept your sacrifice for my sin, and I choose to follow you for the rest of my life. Thank you for receiving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Amen. So for those of you who prayed that on Facebook, please contact the church, resonline.org, or call the church. You'll find it on the website if you go there. And let us know you prayed that for the first time. I'll send you some information free of charge that will help you start this new life. Amen. Colleen, this is my wife, Colleen, for everybody who's visiting. Good morning. Okay, a couple things. First of all, um, this week while we're praying for this, well, this week as 